Chapter 8 of History of France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adele Pooley. History of France by Charlotte M. Younger. Chapter 8. France since the Revolution. 1. The Restoration. The Allies left the people of France free to choose their government, and they accepted the old royal family, who were on their borders awaiting a recall. The son of Louis the Sixteenth had perished in the hands of his jailers, and thus the king's next brother, Louis the Eighteenth, succeeded to the throne, bringing back a large emigrant following. Things were not settled down when Napoleon, in the spring of 1815, escaped from Elba. The army welcomed him with delight, and Louis was forced to flee to Ghent. However, the Allies immediately rose in arms, and the troops of England and Prussia crushed Napoleon entirely at Waterloo on the 18th of June, 1815. He was sent to the lonely rock of St. Helena in the Atlantic, whence he could not gain return to trouble the peace of Europe. There he died in 1821. Louis XVIII was restored and a charter was devised by which a limited monarchy was established, a king at the head and two chambers, one of peers, the other of deputies, but with a very narrow franchise. It did not, however, work amiss, till, after Louis's death in 1824, his brother, Charles X, tried to fall back on the old system. He checked the freedom of the press and interfered with the freedom of elections. The consequence was a fresh revolution in July 1830, happily with little bloodshed, but which forced Charles X to go into exile with his grandchild Henry, whose father, the Duke of Berry, had been assassinated in 1820. 2. Reign of Louis Philippe the Chamber of Deputies offered the crown to Louis Philippe, Duke of Orléans. He was descended from the regent. His father had been one of the Democratic Party in the Revolution, and, when titles were abolished, he called himself Philippe Égalité, Equality. This had not saved his head under the reign of terror and his son had been obliged to flee and lead a wandering life, at one time gaining his livelihood by teaching mathematics at a school in Switzerland. He had recovered his family estates at the Restoration, and, as the head of the Liberal Party, was very popular. He was elected King of the French, not of France with a chamber of peers nominated for life only, and another of deputies elected by voters, whose qualification was 200 francs, or eight pounds a year. He did his utmost to gain the goodwill of the people, living a simple, friendly family life, and trying to merit the term of the Citizen King and in the earlier years of his reign, he was successful. The country was prosperous, and a great colony was settled in Algiers, and endured a long and desperate war with the wild Arab tribes. 
A colony was established in New Caledonia in the Pacific, and attempts were carried out to compensate thus for the losses of colonial possessions which France had sustained in wars with England. Discontents, however, began to arise, on the one hand from those who remembered only the successes of Bonaparte and not the miseries they had caused, and on the other from the working classes, who declared that the bourgeois, or tradespeople, had gained everything by the revolution of July, but they themselves nothing. Louis-Philippe did his best to gratify and amuse the people by sending for the remains of Napoleon and giving him a magnificent funeral and splendid monument among his old soldiers, the Invalides. But his popularity was waning. In 1842, his eldest son, the Duke of Orléans, a favourite with the people, was killed by a fall from his carriage, and this was another shock to his throne. Two young grandsons were left, and the king had also several sons, one of whom, the Duke of Montpensier, he gave in marriage to Louise, the sister and heiress presumptive of the Queen of Spain, though by treaty with the other European powers it had been agreed that she should not marry a French prince unless the Queen had children of her own. Ambition for his family was a great offence to his subjects, and at the same time a nobleman, the Duke de Praslin, who had murdered his wife, committed suicide in prison to avoid public execution, and the Republicans declared, whether justly or unjustly, that this had been allowed rather than let a noble die a felon's death. 3. The Revolution of 1848 In spite of the increased prosperity of the country, there was general disaffection. There were four parties, the Orleanists, who held by Louis-Philippe and his minister Guizot, and whose badge was the tricolour, the Legitimists, who retained their loyalty to the exiled Henry, and whose symbol was a white Bourbon flag, the Bonapartists, and the Republicans, whose badge was a red cap and flag a demand for a franchise that should include the mass of the people was rejected, and the general displeasure poured itself out in speeches at political banquets. An attempt to stop one of these led to an uproar. The National Guard refused to fire on the people, and their fury rose unchecked, so that the king thinking resistance vain, signed an abdication and fled to England in February 1848. A provisional government was formed and a new constitution was to be arranged, but the Paris mob, who found their condition unchanged and really wanted equality of wealth, not of rights, made disturbances again and again and barricaded the streets, till they were finally put down by General Cavignac, while the rest of France was entirely dependent on the will of the capital. After some months, a republic was determined on, which was to have a president at its head, chosen every five years by universal suffrage. Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte nephew of the great Napoleon, was the first president thus chosen. And after some struggles, he not only mastered Paris, but by the help of the army, which was mostly Bonapartist, he dismissed the Chamber of Deputies and imprisoned or exiled all the opponents whom the troops had not put to death on the plea of an expected rising of the mob. 
This was called a coup d'etat, and Louis Napoleon was then declared president for ten years. 4. The Second Empire In December 1852, the president took the title of emperor, calling himself Napoleon III, as successor to the young son of the great Napoleon. He kept up a splendid and expensive court, made Paris more than ever the toy shop of the world, and did much to improve it by the widening of streets and removal of old buildings. Treaties were made which much improved trade, and the country advanced in prosperity. The reins of government were, however, tightly held, and nothing was so much avoided as letting men think or act for themselves, while their eyes were to be dazzled with splendour and victory. In 1853, when Russia was attacking Turkey, the emperor united with England in opposition, and the two armies together besieged Sebastopol, and fought the battles of Alma and Inkerman, taking the city after nearly a year's siege, and then making what is known as the Treaty of Paris, which guaranteed the safety of Turkey so long as the subject Christian nations were not misused. In 1859, Napoleon III joined in an attack on the Austrian power in Italy, and together with Victor Emmanuel, King of Sardinia, and the Italians, gained two great victories at Magenta and Solferino, but made peace as soon as it was convenient to him, without regard to his promises to the King of Sardinia, who was obliged to purchase his consent to becoming King of United Italy by yielding up to France his old inheritance of Savoy and Nice. Meantime, discontent began to spring up at home, and the Red Republican spirit was working on. The huge fortunes made by the successful only added to the sense of contrast. Secret societies were at work, and the emperor, after twenty years of success, felt his popularity waning. 5. The Franco-German War In 1870, the Spaniards, who had deposed their queen, Isabel II, made choice of a relation of the King of Prussia as their king. There had long been bitter jealousy between France and Prussia, and though the prince refused the offer of Spain, the French showed such an overbearing spirit that a war broke out. The real desire of France was to obtain the much-coveted frontier of the Rhine, and the emperor heated their armies with boastful proclamations which were but the prelude to direful defeats at Weissenberg, Worth, and Forbach. At Sudan, the emperor was forced to surrender himself as a prisoner, and the tidings no sooner arrived at Paris than the whole of the people turned their wrath on him and his family. His wife, the Empress Eugenie, had to flee. A republic was declared, and the city prepared to stand a siege. The Germans advanced and put down all resistance in other parts of France. Great part of the army had been made prisoners, and though there was much bravado, there was a little steadiness or courage left among those who now took up arms. Paris, which was blockaded, after suffering much from famine, surrendered in February 1871, and peace was purchased in a treaty by which great part of Alsace and Lorraine 
and the city of Metz were given back to Germany. End of chapter 8 End of History of France by Charlotte M. Younger